And welcome to Morning Coffee. We love this moment each week when we see your names and your faces populating our Zoom call. What a blessing it is to have you here on this beautiful February morning for a special morning coffee call, Black Women Beating Heart Disease, a call to action. We're gonna let a few more folks come in. We're so happy to have you with us as well as our Facebook live audience, which we're sure is populating right now. My name is Lisa Payton Kerr, CEO, founder, and president of the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness. Here with the foundation team, raise your hand team. Yes, uh, hey. yes, and special guests. Three very special guests this morning who are survivors and advocates uh, for heart disease awareness and education, women who have turned around and come back on the other side of health and life. Um, and we're here to talk with them this morning during this very special Heart Disease Month session on Black Women Beating Heart Disease. But we want to remind you that you are here in the space of the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness for Morning Coffee, which is a space we created just for you at your demand uh, through this incredible uh, challenging year we've all faced through this COVID global pandemic. You asked us to provide a space for us to come together, to refresh ourselves, to connect, to talk about the issues we care most about, to inspire each other in our wellness, and to keep us together, mind, body, spirit, during this challenging time. So we're always grateful when you show up in the space with us. And I'm seeing new faces today. Hey, Belly Sullivan. Oh my goodness. I'm so happy to see you. We've got women tuning in from all over. Um, and it's always a treat to have you with us. Um, we have with us today three incredible women who have three incredible stories, and we'll spend the hour talking with them about the critical issue of heart disease and prevention. Our goal here at the foundation is to save Black women's lives by equipping you with the knowledge, the information, the tools you need to live your healthiest, most well life. And today we'll have a conversation that we know you'll find very informative. Um, there's one thing we want you to realize amongst our guests today is these women are young women. These women were young women when they encountered health challenges. And that's a big message that we want you to take away that we must talk about our health and heart disease and stroke prevention at younger ages as black women because we are impacted in a way that is unique to our experiences. And again, our goal is to preserve our lives. With us is Joyce Sampson, a seven time stroke survivor. Oh my goodness, and one of my dear friends. Did you hear me say a seven time stroke survivor? We'll talk with Joy in a minute and we'll give her full bio. Bridget Wilder, who has an incredible health transformation story that began with her husband and has now become her life's work and her own transformation story as a nutritionist, author, and public speaker who will lend her knowledge to us on the call today. And Kimberly Montgomery, who is a heart attack survivor, encountered a heart attack at age 39. And 10 years later, she is here to talk with us about her survival story, but her thriving story, not just her survival story. But before we go down that road, Aaliyah Stevenson, our Chief Programs Officer, has some incredible announcements. We love this segment. We get to inform you of all the wonderful things you should know, uh, starting with a business we want you to support and many other things. Aaliyah. Yes, we have not only a very special guest, but a very special businesswoman with us today. I want to highlight today Persevere Wellness. Bridget Wilder, author, dietitian, motivational speaker, and owner of Perseverance Health and Wellness Coaching. She is available to partner with you to meet your goals. And once you hear her story, you're going to want to contact her to meet your goals. Also want to shout out again, we're talking about heart health. Can't talk about heart health without talking about fitness and nutrition. We have launched Project Live Well. There is still time, ladies, to sign up, register for a series of fitness, nutrition, healthy living classes designed to elevate your health and your glow, your glow. So please, please sign up. I'll put that information in the chat as well. And then of course, we're talking about heart disease, heart health uh, today. This weekend, mark your calendars. This Saturday is Wear Red Day, the 10th annual Wear Red Day. 
And we're talking about this today because heart disease is the number one killer of Americans and women, and of course, black women at the greatest risk. So please join us. We will be joined by a cardiologist to answer all of our questions. It will be a event with some fitness. It will be energizing, inspiring, and information that we must have in order to ensure our health and our wellness. And lastly, we are hitting the last two weeks of a very exciting partnership that the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness has with Pink Lily. Pink Lily has partnered with us. They are selling t-shirts, select Pink Lily t-shirts. 100% of those proceeds, up to $20,000, will go to support the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness. Please pop in the chat if you've already bought your Pink Lily uh, t-shirt or sweatshirt. Please, if you haven't already, we are so close to meeting our goal. We just need this last push in these last couple of weeks to meet our goal of $20,000. The shirts are beautiful. We can all attest to it. They're comfortable. Um, so please, please uh, shop Pink Lily, support them, and you support the foundation. So I will put all that information in the chat. Thanks, Lisa. Awesome. And I am wearing one of my incredible Pink Lily shirts today. If you can see that, Black history is American history. There are several others. Um, as Aaliyah shared, every shirt you buy goes towards the pool of dollars that they have set aside to donate to the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness, $20,000, which we pour directly into all of our programs that we provide consistently free or low cost accessible to every woman. So thank you in advance for your support. Um, as we generally ask at the beginning of each of these calls, we want you to get into the chat and tell us on a scale of one to 10, how you're feeling this morning. Tell us how you're feeling on a scale of one to 10 and drop in any comments that you have about black women and heart disease. How have you been impacted? How have women in your family and community been impacted? What brought you to this call today? And we'll, we'll bring up those comments later as we talk with you throughout the call. So again, back to the topic at hand, black women and heart disease, a call to action. Uh, as Aaliyah shared, we'll be hosting our 10th annual Wear Red Day event this Saturday. This is a very special month and time for us as so many of us on this call have been impacted personally by heart disease. For those of you who know the story of the foundation, you know that much of our origin uh, came from uh, the experience of me losing my mother in 2006 at the age of 64. She died of congestive heart failure, uh, which began for her at the age of 48. And when I think about that and the fact that I'll be 49 in just a few weeks, and at that stage of life, my mother was encountering a heart attack, which really impacted her health for the rest of her life. Um, this is a crucial conversation that we have to have, and not just during National Heart Month, but all year round as Black women and allies of Black women as we do everything we can to preserve our health. The three guests we have here today have been personally impacted. Um, and the first thing I wanna say to Kimberly, Joyce and Bridget is that we're grateful that you are here. You know, as our grandmothers used to say, we're grateful that you're in the land of the living to tell your story. And we know that stories change lives. Um, and most of you, all of you have been also sharing your story in many places and spaces to help other women uh, prevent the onset of heart disease and stroke and to improve and save their own lives. So we honor you for those contributions you continue to make as survivors and thrivers. A few facts, and we want you guys to listen to this intently. Heart disease is the number one cause of both death and disability in women in the United States. As Aaliyah said, as black women, we, not you, we, I'm including myself, have an even higher chance of being impacted by and dying from heart disease and at younger ages compared to our white counterparts. Over 50,000 black women die each year of heart disease. And we have the highest risk of stroke amongst all women. This is verified in the data. How big is this problem? About 49% or roughly half of black women over the age of 20. We didn't say over the age of 50. We said over the age of 20 have some form of heart disease like clogged arteries in our heart, our arms, our legs, stroke, high blood pressure, angina, uh, and other conditions, high cholesterol. We hear a lot in our community, folks who are battling high cholesterol. 
These numbers mean that one in every two Black women in the United States has heart disease. So I want you to look at the faces on this call, and I'm not sure which view you're in, if you're looking at the view of all of us together. If you count off every two women on this call, one out of every two of us possibly has the risk of having a heart disease condition. So we're asking you today, if you've not scheduled your annual physical exam with your healthcare provider, make the call after this show today and set up your appointment to go check on yourself. We know there's barriers and challenges uh, with COVID maybe of accessing your physician, but make the call, put things in motion, check on yourself. If you've got a Walgreens or a CVS nearby, go check your blood pressure, do what we need to do because it makes a difference in saving our lives. And we talk a lot about the statistics and we hear the word death a lot, but we're really here to talk about life and survival, but we have to share the facts. So Kimberly, Bridget and Joyce are here today to talk to us about life and how they beat the odds. And I'll introduce them right now. Kimberly Montgomery is the Director of Intergovernmental Relations for the City of Milwaukee. For over 24 years, Kimberly has worked in various leadership capacities in local government and business. But while living her full busy life and career, Kimberly, a mom of one, suffered a silent heart attack on August 20th, 2011 at the age of 39. Right? At the time? 49. 49. At the I was age 49. Of, at 49. Okay. Yeah. At that time, Kimberly described herself as a health nut who ran every day, practiced yoga, made an effort to eat a healthy diet. She did have high blood pressure, but with her doctor's help, she was managing that condition. It was under control. Her cholesterol levels were excellent. But while driving home one evening from her hot yoga class, she began to sweat profusely. She became nauseous, sick to her stomach. She stopped at a friend's house who suggested they go to the doctor. They walked to urgent care where doctors told Kimberly she was having a heart attack um, and shortly after had two stints put in. She'll tell us more. Luckily today, Kimberly is healthy as you can see on the call. She's living life as a survivor and advocate. Uh, and she is a former American Heart Association Go Red ambassador. Uh, which is how I met Kimberly online and have been trying to get her on one of these calls for about three or four years amongst her very busy schedule. So we're very happy, Kimberly, to have you here today. Thank you. And here. Bridget Wilder. Bridget Wilder is a widowed mother of nine children and CEO of Perseverance Health and Wellness Nutrition Consultation Services. She's a dietitian, author, and motivational speaker based in Milwaukee. As a dietitian, she uses her knowledge to help her clients improve their overall nutritional health by teaching the concepts of nutrition and psychology. She incorporates uh, wellness uh, for corporations and companies where she teaches wellness education for organizations like Susan G. Komen, the American Cancer Society, the Milwaukee Area Health Center, and she has a riveting story of her own health transformation. If you, if you walk around or, or Google the health scene in Milwaukee, you will see Bridget's name come up in many places and spaces. But if you visit her Facebook page, you'll also learn a lot about her personal weight loss transformation and healthy lifestyle that has really become an inspiration for other women who she coaches every day through her nutrition and wellness practice. So we'll, we'll love to hear about that shortly as well, Bridget, thank you for being here. Uh, and last but not least, my beautiful friend, Joyce Sampson. Um, I must tell you all that Joyce and I go way back. We met about 15 years ago, shortly after Joyce had experienced her seventh stroke. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Joyce is a stroke awareness advocate working with Circle of Rights Incorporated, which is a nonprofit stroke education organization in the state of Maryland, and American Heart Stroke Association as a volunteer. The American Heart Association designated Joyce in 2014 as a stroke hero for her courage and steadfast determination throughout her stroke recovery, which I witnessed to take so much, Joyce, for you to come all the way back from what was an incredibly life-threatening set of circumstances. 
In 2009, Joyce had a series of seven strokes in two months. She lost her ability to speak, to read, to write, and to count, as well as other cognitive disruptions such as loss of imagination. During her stay in a nursing home and later visits to support groups, she met stroke survivors with aphasia so severe that there was little hope for recovery. And she was compelled to use her voice to represent them in a small way, even as she was healing. Since 2011, Joyce has spoken about her experiences to raise awareness of the signs and symptoms of stroke, which we know is a cardiovascular disease among the family of heart diseases. Um, she teaches on the risk factors and prevention to college students studying public health, members of civic groups, hospital support groups, young mothers, and men living in temporary shelters. She's a consummate educator. I've been so inspired to watch you, Joyce, because I remember us talking about uh, you not being sure if you could do it. And then you jumped into it um, and have become a stellar educator who is saving people's lives daily. Uh, in 2018, in observance of National Stroke Awareness Month, Joyce organized and secured funding for One Heart Fitness Fair to stress the benefits of exercise and healthy eating as preventative measures for stroke. And Joyce is with us today to share her story. So I know you guys are as excited as we are to hear from these women and we'll jump right in. You all have amazing stories of the impact of heart, stroke, and cardiovascular diseases in your life. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Kimberly, and why being a part of today's discussion on Black women beating heart disease is personal to you. Um, being a part of today's conversation is important to me because of the fact that um, I was unaware of what was going on. It was, to me, everyday life. And there are probably many women out there who think that the minor symptoms that they are experiencing um, are just everyday life, kind of wear and tear, if you will. Um, just being a mom, working, and um, stress on your body. As you said, I worked, I worked with in, in politics. There's nothing more stressful than politics. And um, my actual heart attack put guilt on a lot of council members and a mayor. I had so many flowers, it was unbelievable because of the fact that I was balancing my life and it just appeared to be normal. And it's not normal. And what COVID did, it brought out, it emphasized even more so the disparities in black people and how we handle and we have to recognize and share the information with one another to take care of ourselves to listen to our bodies um, to become advocates for ourselves and for our children and for our future i have heart disease my son's father has heart disease you know my son has to watch you know what he does his health and, and we were a healthy family for the most part. Um, as you said, active uh, every day. At 39, I had a hypertension emergency. That's why that number 39 is, is sticking in your head. Yes. And because of my father experiencing, witnessing two of his three strokes, I knew something was wrong. So I went to the hospital. And my blood pressure was 200, I'll, I'll never forget it, it was 222 over 161. So I was starting to stroke. Um, ever since then, I've watched my health. My son plays basketball, my son is a basketball coach now. So we made exercise a part of our lives and fun. We, you know, in the grocery store, we're watching we're reading nutritional level, uh, 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 the nutritional charts. How much sodium do you have in your bread? Well, I have this much. And still, 10 years later, I have this heart attack that I attributed to everything but a heart attack. I 
was sweating, as you said, coming from hot yoga. I thought I hadn't cooled down from hot yoga. And then um, I became nauseated and I attended a, a, an event the night before. So I thought I had food poisoning. And Kimberly, I'm going to stop you right there before you tell your story, because that's our next question. But oh, OK. I <laughs> but I want but that's to why that's the reason why I'm here. Yes, um, because everybody has to know. To listen everybody. to their body. And, and in what you shared, you're talking about how our family systems, black family systems are impacted by health crises, by heart disease. You spoke of your son's father. You spoke about your father. We're talking about family. Um, patterns over generations of struggling with these diseases and coming to a place where we really have to break those cycles through how we live and the choices that we make um, with that. Uh, Bridget, why is being here today on this very critical conversation important to you? Oh, wow. This conversation is so important to me because my husband passed away from congestive heart failure and my children were 16 to four months. I was a 35 year old widow and my life changed. It spiraled from zero to hundred. I just, I was blown out of a cannon. First of all, I went into shock because here I was this young widow with all of these children. I didn't even know what to do with that. And I wasn't yet a dietitian. And uh, three years before my husband passed, I also lost a child. So that was another hit to my soul to everything that I um, thought about life, it just shifted. So now I use my story to save others so that the pain that I experienced, I can save others. It's, it's always say that I was um, sheep for the slaughter in, 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 in regards to having to go through it to understand how I can help impact others. So, and to piggyback on what Kimberly was saying, it definitely impacts the family because now my children are at risk for heart disease. Some of them have symptoms. I have a 12 year old that has high blood pressure. So I, it's very critical for me to be an example <clears throat> of what that means to eat right. So in my own journey, um, in order to be an example to my clients and for my own health, because I became my first client, is I lost 170 pounds, but that wasn't enough. I wanted to infuse um, psychology, which is another degree I have, to help people understand the why behind their eating, eating behavior so that they can make changes long-term. Because one thing is for sure, no matter what disease we have, if we don't modify our mindset and approach to food, we'll stay stagnated and we can't come, up, come out of a cycle of um, the wrong choices for food. So that is my main reason why. And now, you know, doing stuff like this is healing for me because by helping other people understand what a nutrition label means, why should you read it? What should you eat? That's saving lives. And oftentimes when we go to the doctor, their approach is medication and that's great, but food is healing in and of itself. But if we don't know that, we can't change that. Awesome. That's so powerful. And Kimberly uh, and Bridget, you're touching on so many vast different topics of this conversation. One being understanding our family history, understanding the impact in our families, modifying our own behaviors, our own lifestyle practices around eating, around exercise, around reading labels, about having these conversations directly with your family members consciously and setting an example for our children who are absolutely impacted uh, by our choices, our behaviors. And, and also to point to the fact that we know that in many cases of our families, these can be hereditary conditions, congenital. So we don't wanna overlook the piece that we're not always creating these conditions, but uh, Bridget, you spoke a lot to food. And we know from recent studies that food accounts for so much of what can make or break our heart health and our physical health. And so it's crucial that we continue to have that conversation about food, nutrition, as well as uh, consulting your physician, going to the doctor, but doing your part at home, right? So that we cannot be managed more heavily by medication than we are by our own practices. With that, Joyce, 
Why is being on this call today for this crucial conversation so important to you? And you have to unmute yourself so we can hear you. There we go. So anyway, what those young ladies said, crucial. That's why, um, you know, it's important to be here. But um, as a stroke survivor, um, the thing is, people don't like to talk about stroke. They are um, very afraid. It's a scary thing to process. And um, I found when I was in the hospital and everything and going to support groups, um, nobody knew anything about stroke, any, anything about the diet, nutrition, how that paid, played a role, um, medical care all the time, and uh, keeping up with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and all those things. And then all of a sudden you, you have a stroke, you don't know what it is. Uh, I know a woman, they kept her in the emergency room for 24 hours before they even saw her because she, they said um, she was too young to have a stroke. And so I've seen so many people that don't know the signs and symptoms of stroke. And the longer you take to get to the hospital, the more chance of permanent disabilities. And um, if you ask me later, I'll tell you, you know, how brain damage is, is terrible. And I can tell you right now, you know, myself, I can hardly remember how to tie my shoes, you know, half the time. But you know, after um, a lot of therapy, a lot of getting, you know, doing it yourself, you learn to do that. So that's why it's important to me. I like to let everyone know, whoever listens, what the symptoms are, what you can do to prevent it. So that's why. You know, Joyce, um, hearing you say this and remembering how we met, if you don't mind me telling the story very briefly, uh, I went to church one Sunday with my kids and I had to take one of them outside because, you know, they were acting up in church. <laughs> and then I saw this beautiful woman stepping off of a van, you know, those kind of vans that pick up folks who are convalescing or, or healing or recovering from conditions and you were stepping down from the van with a cane. And I, was, I don't even remember. Yes, I remember it explicitly. I um, and I remember thinking, wow, that woman is so young to be stepping off of this van with a cane. She's so beautiful. I wonder what happened. And somehow we came together after church and began to talk with each other. And that's when you told me, you know, I just, I've had seven strokes and this is the first time I've really left my house to venture out because I've been afraid to go out because I'm not sure what would happen. And I'm, I'm in this healing process. Um, and I think maybe that was 2000, I don't know. 2010? About 2010, maybe 2008. Um, and your speech was a little slurred and you were telling me that you were relearning how to speak how to write, how to read, as we said in your bio. And I just want folks to hear that and to understand that the Joyce that you're seeing on this call today, who is not the Joyce that I met, um, was a young woman who found herself in this predicament with no, I don't know if you had warning signs, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I wanna speak to, to your recovery, the fact that you're here and the full faculty of your mind and your speech well, some of it. <laughs> and the full faculty by God's grace and the hard work and therapies and recovery you had to go through. And to stress to you all, that is why this conversation is so important. And we have to have these conversations as black women because these are real occurrences that are facing us at a higher level than any other group of women. Um, and the fact that we're here with these women today talking about the aftermath on a positive note is miraculous. With that, Aaliyah. Yeah, I just wanna uh, begin by just thanking uh, both our guests and our audience for uh, sharing their stories. This is just, there's a thread um, in the chat, Lisa, of folks who have been impacted by heart disease. Um, Joyce, as I listen to you, it reminds me of when my heart failed at 26. Um, I just had my third child sitting on the couch, breastfeeding, trying to drink water. And all of a sudden I realized I couldn't keep the water in my mouth. And um, my husband looked at me, he's like, what's wrong with your face? 
um, not even knowing what was happening at all, um, ended up being rushed to the hospital, but they thought it was a stroke. They thought it was a stroke, ended up being um, heart failure, but they thought it was a stroke. So I wanna, I wanna talk more about those warning signs because I ignored all the warning signs through my whole pregnancy and the doctors missed these signs as well. I ignored the swelling. I ignored the, the shortness of breath. I thought, oh, I'm just pregnant. I'm just really getting overweight this time. Um, and I only could take a couple steps before catching my breath. Um, had to sleep in certain positions. So I was, oh, it's just the pregnancy. So if we could just begin with you, Joyce, talking about that crisis, but talking about those warning signs as well. So what happened? Um, what did you ignore that you later realized, like myself? Well, you know, the thing is, I didn't know anything about word retrieval. You know, I had no idea anything about stroke. And um, I, the first stroke, I was trying to call my son, and I couldn't get his name out. And, um, and then I was asked him to help me find my keys. I didn't know, I couldn't find the word. But being that I was feeling fine physically, you know, all I knew was something was wrong. And I said, you know, what is this? I had no idea. So that was the first one. The second one, I went, well, the first one I went to the hospital, they said it was a, um, a stroke. I couldn't believe that because I was still walking around. All I knew is people who have strokes are paralyzed. That's what I thought. And um, the second one, I was, standing up over the bed and and um my legs gave out and they just crumbled i you know just had to hold myself down as i was going to the floor that was it and then the third one uh, two days later i woke up tried to open my email and i couldn't get it open so and i didn't have anyone to talk to so i didn't know i had aphasia so i was I called my sister and all I could say was when she answered the phone was um, this sound of a dead battery, da, 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 that's it. So that was kind of frightening, you know, but um, the only typical signs that I had were when I went to the hospital, to the emergency room, then I started having the drooling and the face um, paralysis and, um, you know, those kind of things, the drooling and the paralysis. And, um, but this, the signs that people don't know, that they don't, um, aren't aware of, you know, you, and the problem with this is that it mimics so many natural things that could happen to you. We're afraid to go to the hospital because we, we feel ridiculous. Why am I going to the hospital for this? I'm just dizzy. I'm just confused, you know. But I found that hospital staff um, are very knowledgeable about the signs. And when you go, that's the thing I talk about in education presentations. Don't be afraid to go to the hospital when you feel ridiculous. You know, it doesn't matter, just go. Because the longer you wait for a stroke and having a stroke, there's a two hour, I believe, period where they can give you the clot busting drug. And then that'll eliminate permanent disabilities or make it less if you get to the hospital in time, so. Now I forgot what I was talking about. That's that memory loss I have. I have a anterior grade and retrograde amnesia where um, I can remember everything else, you know, like two weeks ago. And then all of a sudden I can't remember what I just said, you know? So those are the things, memory loss is one of them. When you get, you think, oh my God, I'm just getting old, you know? So those are, and balance. When you're um, walking around and you find yourself tripping over nothing, those are signs. Wow, thank you for sharing those. Um, and, and thank you, um, Aaron, uh, describing to us what is aphasia um, and what is the phenomenon of the, you know, the tip of the tongue, like you know what you wanna say and can't. Um, those are things, all of us are in the middle of a speech and wonder to ourselves, like, what was I talking about? And so I think paying attention to the, the numbers of signs. And I thank you so much as women, we always do this. We say, oh, it's nothing. It's just stress. It's just the, the bad food that I ate. It's just whatever. We, 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 um, we shirk these things to the side. And, and make a reason for them. And also, I mean, that goes into talking about why we have fear to go to the doctor in the first place and feelings of not being heard and not being responded to. So that brings a whole nother level. 
Um, Kimberly, can we talk about you now? Can we talk about your health crisis, when it began? What things did you ignore? What are the symptoms and signs? Well, I have to concur with Joyce. Everything Joyce was experiencing, I experienced at 39 when I had that hypertension emergency. I couldn't, I was looking at my boss at work and couldn't say his name. I knew I knew him, but I didn't know his name. So it started there, like I said before, um, with the hypertension emergency and the fact that uh, I had witnessed two of my father's three strokes uh, and the symptoms of that, I kind of knew something was going on with me the first time. Uh, therefore, that's the reason why I did watch what I ate, um, my nutritional charts and everything with my son. And then um, again, as Joyce mentioned, I um, had symptoms that mimicked other uh, illnesses. I, as I was saying before, coming home from hot yoga, I was still hot. I just thought I hadn't cooled off or was having a hot flash. I was 49. My sister had, she was younger than I and she had had them already and I witnessed how severe they were. So I just attributed it to everything but what it was. And then I became nauseated and I attended an event and um, the night before, and I just thought it was the opening of a restaurant. So I thought it was food poisoning. So when I, when I called my friend to say, can I just come lay down? I don't feel good. I never attributed it to a stroke or a heart attack. I just didn't feel good. And luckily she lived nearby that when I arrived at her home, she said I was gray. She said, I, I remember her saying, you're not lying down on my couch. We're going immediately to urgent care. And still, as Joyce mentioned, putting it off, we walked, it was across the street, but we walked to urgent care. I still, I did not recognize it didn't sink in to me um, the fact that I was having a heart attack, although I was told I was having a heart attack in urgent care, um, in, in the ambulance, because I was in urgent care and they had to transfer me uh, via ambulance to uh, the nearest hospital who could treat me in the, in the ambulance. I asked to use my phone to call my son and say, hey, they say I'm having a heart attack, but I'm not having a heart attack. You don't have to come to the, to the, you know, to the hospital. It really wasn't until I pulled up in the emergency room, saw the cardiologist, and he said, we have to go in into your heart and see how much damage was caused by the heart attack. And when I asked, now, that family that I told not to come, I said, well, can we wait for family to come for me to consult with them? He said, I'm afraid not. That's when it sunk into me, you know, I'm having a heart attack. And then two stints later, I asked, you know, how was I able to work out with, and I don't know if we're gonna get into this later, but the severity of how um, blocked my arteries that, he insert, inserted the stents into, they were at 80% and 70, 80% and 75%. And I didn't know how, how could I do that? And he said, honestly, if I hadn't been working out and active every day, the outcome would have been a lot more severe. So the, ultimately exercising did help me, but the signs and the symptoms, they do mimic other illnesses. And just witnessing my father and his loss of, loss of memory, loss of time, that is what, um, you know, just put the light bulb on and said, um, something's going on, just like, like Joyce said. But I will tell you this, I participated in the city of Milwaukee's wellness program. And in 2010, when they took all of my panel numbers, I, they told me that I had a 0.5% risk of having a heart attack in 10 years. And I had a heart attack one year later. I'm 
having lots of wow moments. <laughs> yeah. It was predis it was predisposition though for me. Yes. yes. Mine was predisposition, my father, my maternal grandfather. And when you talk about family history and they ask you about it, you know, you don't think about that first cousin that lives in Cleveland that had two or three heart attacks, you know? You think about your immediate family. So that 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 is the awareness that we have to bring. No, I you're... just have to interject really quick, oh, wow. Aaliyah, because I know you're gonna ask Bridget the next question. Joyce, how old were you at the time of your first stroke? I was 53. 53. Um, Kimberly, you were 49 at the time of your heart attack, 39 with a hypertensive episode. Bridget, how old were you when uh, your husband was how old when he passed away? My, my husband was 37 and I was 35. I want you all to hear those numbers because we often believe that this discussion about heart disease and stroke is an elderly woman's conversation. We think we envision 80, 90 year old is the point in our lives where we have to worry about heart conditions. It is not. I don't want you to leave this call not understanding clearly that this conversation is for us. I'm 49. Aaliyah is in her 40s. We know people, we know women who've had heart attack strokes who are living with high blood pressure, high cholesterol in their 20s and 30s, in their 40s. Uh, We've read research, and this has been the case in my life by my mother's example and the women that I talk about in my speeches, whose lives caused us to create this foundation, this organization. They were perhaps 64, 62, when they died of heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes complications. So there's research that says the new life expectancy for black women appears to be 64 or 65. I wanna know by show of hands, who is that acceptable to on this call? 64 or 65, our life expectancy. This is why this is a crucial conversation and I want you to remember another thing that Kimberly said, that Joyce said, listen to your body and take yourself to the doctor. Do not wait, do not lay down. There was a person on Facebook, a woman who came to a friend of mine, Shahana McKinney Balden, who came to our Wear Red Day event several years ago. And she heard us say, if something is wrong, if it doesn't feel right, we've all said that we know when something's wrong. You knew something was wrong. You didn't know what it is, but you knew it wasn't right. Don't pause. She said, I knew something wasn't right. And so I decided to drive myself to the hospital and they told her what they told you Kimberly that she was about to have a massive heart attack she was in her 40s it saved her life to get to the doctor immediately don't pause don't hesitate just go uh, and we we shared that message with someone who uh, sent us a message in the chat Patricia go don't wait another day Aaliyah all those things and um, know your family history know your family history. I think that is another thing that rang completely clear because it wasn't until after my heart failed that I learned my family history. It no longer became surprising. And now those lines of communication are open. And uh, unfortunately, there's still folks in my family who are, who are um, dealing with heart disease and, and waiting on heart transplants. And um, so know your family history, have those conversations. The other thing I wanna point out is your friend, Kimberly, and my husband, sometimes we don't even see it ourselves. We're so busy in it. It's so important for when you see somebody and we advocate, go, no, not, I, well, I'm wondering, go. Um, so those advocates, so Bridget, I wanna to talk to you because I'm wondering what you saw, you know, as not the person whose heart was failing, but witnessing someone whose heart was failing. What, were, what, would, what did you see as the best? Oh my God. Um, I saw my first classroom experience as a dietitian was with my family not even knowing I was going to be one I learned how to feed my husband too late so when I went to a nutrition classroom as an older adult all of these things that they taught about heart disease in relation to nutrition I used to leave the room crying because had I had that information I could have had him longer so knowledge is extremely important 
um, knowing family history is extremely important. As she said, like I said, I have a 12 year old that has high blood pressure. So I have to be on top of everything. But the highlight that I learned is the correlation between nutrition and health and, and other things that lead to heart disease like diabetes and the string effect that can lead to negative health outcomes. So no, um, all of these things have a connected piece. So that's the one thing that I, I want to, um, and, and the other thing that I learned is the power of a woman when it comes to taking control and helping relieve those family outcomes. Because we do most of the primary care. We buy the food, we take care of the children. So our hands-on knowledge, we don't have to be a nutrition exper uh, um, expert to learn, to read food labels and things like that. So I learned this as a mother, um, having as many children and a husband, my role was so significant in my knowledge and um, connecting, my, connecting myself to people who knew, knew what to tell me was key and critical. So that, that would be um, something that I would wanna share. Never feel like just because you didn't go to school for something, you can't get the information to share. That's just, it, it doesn't go like that. I post a lot of stuff on Facebook to give people free advice on what to eat because I just want to help. I mean, I, I, of course people I pay me for what I do, but wherever there is opportunity for me to share knowledge, I just do it because I know that there's a need. And if, and like I said earlier, if I, if I can keep somebody else's husband here longer and, and, and keep a mother here longer to, to be with her family, why not share that wealth of knowledge? Why not be a tool in the community uh, for African-American people who don't see a lot of people that look like me that's a dietitian? Oftentimes, it's good to see a familiar face that identifies with your circumstance, your eating habits. All of these things, as an as a African-American dietitian, I help everyone, but I see the critical connection in the women that looks like me. Was that enough? Or? That is enough. <laughs> you know, we're, we're just letting this sink in because this is bringing a lot of, of activity in the chat. And I want to ask uh, Aaliyah to tell us what's, what's being said in the chat. We see a lot of messages streaming through. There's so much being shared in the, in the chat. Um, obviously, the biggest thing is if, you, if your doctor's not working for you, switch mm -hmm. doctors. Yeah. Yes. So I just want to share that. If your doctor's not working for you, switch doctors. Um, know these things. Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, again, posting signs of stroke in there. They don't always look or signs of heart attack. They don't always look what we see on TV. Thank you so much to our guests for sharing that. Um, we're talking about and people are reacting. Thank you, Lisa, to your comment around we do have some power and control as women, as providers um, to make these these changes in our lives. So that's powerful. Um, yeah, and, and then we're talking about misdiagnosis and sometimes our symptoms are different. I have to tell you when I went in and they thought I was having a stroke, um, uh, that was their first thought. And then they're like, oh, well maybe, and they went on a whole line, a list of things before they realized they were gonna send me home uh, for, for my heart to fail completely. So we must ask questions, we must push, we must advocate for ourselves. So we're talking about that in the chat as well. So, so much good stuff going on in the chat, just, but a lot of appreciation for what's being, being shared today. I'd like to add something. Yeah, go Can ahead. You, can you, oh, um, about doctors. I feel like I'm muted. Am I muted? Can you hear no, me? We hear you. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, about doctors, a lot of times we think we're, it's not possible to get a team of doctors. I have been, you know, you say if your doctor is not working, get rid of them. I was very fortunate. Um, the hematologist who came in to see me in 2009, he, um, he was called in to test me for genetics to see if I had a predisposition to creating blood clots. And he's been my hematologist ever since. And every time he communicates with me via email, he talks to all my doctors. He has them all, like five of them. And every time he talks about something that's crucial to my overall health, he includes them in that group. Every now and then I have had to fire one, <laughs> you know, because they weren't, you know, they weren't in the group. So they had to go. 
but it is possible to find doctors who will take you your health seriously and, and personally. So, you know, just don't take it if you, you know, it is possible. That's so hard to hear because that's such a critical part of what we are talking about in our community and communities all over in relation to every aspect of Black women's health is your physician can make the difference between you living or dying. It really is that serious. It comes up a lot in our discussions about Black maternal health, uh, maternal mortality, Black women, the rates at which we're dying in pregnancy or as a result of pregnancy. There's a lot of research pointing to the lack of care the lack of conscious or culturally competent attentive care. And that stretches across the board when we're talking about our health as black women in general. So don't be afraid to push with those questions uh, to keep searching for the doctor and the team as Joyce said, that works for you. Uh, we know Bridget that you have to leave very soon. Um, I do wanna remind everyone that we will have a cardiologist board certified car uh, cardiologist with us as our primary expert at this Saturday's Wear Red Day event. So today was about stories. Saturday will be a lot more factual information about signs, symptoms, recovery from a medical perspective, along with another survivor story. So we want you to be there um, on Saturday as a second half of this crucial continuing conversation about uh, heart disease. Bridget, what do you wanna say to women on this call as you think about the road to recovery uh, for you as a survivor of someone who said something very, very honest and very difficult um, is if you had known what you knew then in terms of habits and behaviors, perhaps, you know, we mm -hmm. never know, perhaps you would have been in a, a better position to practice eating in a way that, you know, preserved your husband's health. We first, that's not your response, you know, it's not your fault, right? And I'm sure you've come to that conclusion because we're all learning as we go. We're coming into knowledge. Um, and there are many, many factors that weigh into our health histories, but there's some truth in that is that when we know better, we can do better. And you've certainly learned so much that has become transformational for your family and for your own health. Tell us a little bit about your personal transformation that's been prompted by this new knowledge that you come into? Let me tell you, um, let me just say this, that I, I took that energy from what I thought about my husband to help others. So I never blame myself, but I, be, I, 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 I found out how important my role is in servicing others. Um, now, my personal journey is this. I, I also had some bouts with blood clotting in my legs. And the relation that I found was obesity and heart health. And for me, um, losing weight uh, reduced my outcomes significantly. So on my journey um, to wellness and uh, modifying my eating behaviors, one thing I want to leave with everybody is have, you don't have to be small, skinny, or anything like that. But any small change can make a key change or a, a significant role in at least reducing your risk. Not saying that you don't have to take medication, but just you know, modifying your eating behaviors, which is what I had to do. So Lisa, for me, that journey of connecting why I was eating like that was key. My triggers, um, eating out of fear, eating out of loneliness, loss, those things in life we still have challenges of. So when we're on a journey of wellness, we also need to see what is keeping us there. If I can't deal with my environment and I'm in a, in a place of chaos, it's very difficult to modify eating behaviors by not, while not adjusting, uh, addressing what's causing it. So I would encourage all of you all to tap into what's really going on in your environment that's affecting you. Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you struggling with a lot? During COVID-19, people are having a lot of imbalances in life. And if they eat a lot, eating the wrong foods, it could uh, increase their risk to disease. So for me, um, fear increased my risk because I wasn't able to address my, my um, change unless I dealt with my issues, if that makes sense. 
So I really want to encourage you all as we see our doctors, as we see nurses or dietitians, have someone that can help you strategize with your mindfulness because that's something that I have to do. Absolutely. And I know what Yes, we, we see several folks saying that they want to follow you on Facebook, Bridget. They want to learn more about your services. They want to hear more about your story. Um, there's a lot more to your story and to all the stories that we're hearing today. We know that we scheduled this call through 1015, um, but I know some of our guests need to go. So you just signal us, uh, Kimberly. We know you have a busy, busy job in the mayor's office, Joyce. So let us know. Um, I do want to hear from you, Kimberly, the road to recovery. Uh, what did that look like for you coming back from and learning and relearning how to live again as a woman with a heart condition? Um, for me, it was, it was a little difficult because of the fact that um, prior to these incidents, whether it was the hypertension emergency or the heart attack, um, I consider myself pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know the changes to make, you know, because we did eat healthy. Uh, we were exercising. Um, so it was really, it was difficult to make adjustments when you didn't know where the adjustments were needed to be made. Um, but piggybacking on the collaboration of your doctors, my doctors, um, for me, as Joyce said, were um, were wonderful and and they were a blessing. They were they were sent to me by God because one, my cardiologist I met in the emergency room, and so he just he just happened to be on call that day, and ends up being <laughs> the chief of uh, catheterization, and so. Uh, I, I have a wonderful relationship with my doctors. And um, I also, by through a friend, I was referred to a nephrologist to, to take a look at my um, blood pressure. And that's when I went to see her for the first time, she said to me, I'm so glad people are recognizing the correlation of the relationship of hypertension and heart disease and kidney failure, the whole nine. And so she 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 managed my my blood pressure for ten years. And so um, the road for uh, to recovery was hard, but every day I'm still watching what I, you know. My heart attack was ten years ago, thank God now, and I still watch what I eat. I try to stay active. I'm more conscious and I listen to my body. You know, recently I had an incident and I listened to my body and I called my doctor immediately. I didn't question, don't question. Wow, so powerful. And we're, we're not only hearing powerful stories, we're getting an education, we're learning new terms, nephrologist uh, as a kidney doctor, nephrology study of the kidney. Um, it's so interesting that you bring that up, uh, Kimberly, as we know so many young women who are on dialysis in their 30s and their 40s, and the connections haven't been made between hypertension and these conditions. Um, and these are just critical conversations to just show us our education has to increase and expand consciously on these topics and begin to go through your family, think about those family members you have who are struggling with these conditions and connect the dots um, and expand your own knowledge and awareness about your own risk and the need to educate yourself so you can also help our family members who are struggling with conditions but they don't understand the big picture of what's happening uh, with their health. That is so vitally important. I'm, I'm gonna have to jump off, but there's one thing that I, I do wanna share with you and that's when I, um, the year that I represented the American Heart Association as the uh, Go Red for Women ambassador, there were 10 of us that were chosen. And out of that 10, we didn't know each other. We were chosen from all across you know, the United States and, and they brought us together to tell our stories. Our stories were different. Our stories 
ranged from people waiting on a heart transplant, you know, to be a heart to become available to to my heart attack, to stroke, then heart attack. But one thing I did notice that year, and I stressed, is that out of 10 women, 60% uh, of us were minorities. We were Black and Latino. And also, out of 10 women, two of us were in our 20s, three of us were in our 30s, Three of us were in our forties, and at the time of our, at the time of the picture taking, I was then fifty. So, um, and so I said that two of us were, you know, forty plus. And it's not an old white man's disease, and that's what people think. So, with that, my blessings to all of you all. I, I'm I'm here. <laughs> if you need anything, and and take care of your health. Thank you, Kimberly. We will invite you. you back um, and we appreciate you so much. Thank you for helping make the connection after all this time. Your testimony is powerful and we will see you soon. Oh, and I told Aaliyah I would stand up and show my t-shirt. I have to show my Go Red t-shirt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye-bye. And now, Joy. You have oh. become the centerpiece of our conversation as we close out, uh, which is so fitting, right? Which is so fitting. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the question you want me to answer? Let me tell you the first thing I want to say to everyone um, is that you're right. It's whoever said that it's not an old white man's disease. Can you see this? Yes. This woman is one of my colleagues at Circle of Right. She, that little baby she has in her hands, she, that baby was three months old when she had two strokes. She can't be more than 35 years old. And um, so she's partially paralyzed on one side. She does the advocacy with me. This woman, she had a, she's the one I talked about who had her stroke when she was um, early 40s, 38 to 40, she ran every day. She was healthy. She stayed in the emergency room 20 some hours because they thought she was too young to be having a stroke. She created an organization based on her experiences called Young Stroke to advocate for people who are young and people survivors and to spread that information. And as um, I think was it Bridget was talking about, um, you know, food, why we eat, how we eat, you know, are we sad, are we mad, all these things that happen to us. And I wanna stress that it doesn't, a lot of people think it costs money to do things, self-care. Self-care doesn't always have to cost money. YouTube has a bunch of videos on <laughs> uh, chakra balancing. Everything you need to know is on YouTube. That's what I say. I started um, having, you know, doing my skin. I, I decided I wanted to feel better about myself. So I'd get avocado and stuff in and make my own little stuff for my face. And I make my own bath salts, you know, and make myself feel like I'm going to a spa because all of that is part of self-care. And it's crucial that we take care of ourselves you know, that part, the mental part and everything like that. And also I wanna piggyback off someone who's talking about nutrition. Um, I didn't, I eat, you know, if I could survive off a cake for breakfast, lunch and dinner, <laughs> that's what I would do. But um, I try to be mindful of what I eat and uh, it's very important. I teach um, a group of young women, um, their mothers, they're about 20 they live with their parents who are older. So I tell them about eating right. And the, you know, amazing that they um, actually take the information. They're very excited about eating right. So I feel good about the fact that I'm reaching young people so that they can impart that knowledge to the older people in the house. Because right now they are the people who buy the food and, and cook the dinner and everything. They were eating tacos in Greece you know, until I came along and showed them how to 
use vegetables and make different things to make them, you know, healthier. So. Joyce, you're speaking to so many things um, and we have so many questions for you. One, what, what did it take to recover from seven strokes? Well, uh, they came every, <laughs> they came every week. <laughs> so it was, um, it was kind of insane. Uh, the thing about stroke is that it turns you into a different person. Uh, the loss is, um, is overwhelming. My loss wasn't physical. It was, um, it was, I was afraid all the time. I had to be by someone because I was always fearful that I was having another stroke. After seven, you, everything is a stroke, you know? So um, then I decided I needed to eat right. My memory was shot. And um, I learned about um, Mary. Rosemary is called the king of the memory. I didn't know that. So I started eating rosemary on everything, rosemary chicken, rosemary capsules, rosemary everything. So I don't know if it helped, but um, what they say, it couldn't hurt. So that's what I did. And, um, and then when I couldn't, I was determined to read and write again. And I'm not one of those kind of people who accepts a no for the answer. So I decided, you know, well, I'm going to do it. So I found a therapist at George Washington hospital it's um, the speech and learn center and they have students who see you for a price well i didn't know it was for a price when i got there somebody told me it was a study so anyway they agreed to see me so for two years i went there for free and so that's another thing you can't always um think that the first i never take the first no for an answer don't you know there's always a way to get what you need. Screw insurance, screw this. <laughs> you know, you have to use your, um, the thing your parents taught you to, you know, to get through anything the way you can. Make what my mother used to say, make a way out of no way. Absolutely. So that's what you have to do. And so I started trying to eat right. I signed up for a gym. Um, it was free <laughs> at, um, at the, uh, what was it? by Redskin Stadium. Anyway, I went three days a week and I built myself up. And I tell you, if it weren't for that exercise, I don't think I'd be here because I didn't realize how bad a shape I was in until I went to class. I said, oh my geez, I could, you know, I could fall out here. I don't, you know, it's horrible. But so I did that and um, let's see, the eating is still bad. I still eat cake too much and, um, I do make my green smoothies. So I suggest people do that. So anything else you wanna know? Cause I'm forgetting what you asked me. That's okay. We are just, we are, we are loving listening to you and we are understanding and hearing all the things that you've learned along the way. Uh, oh, I wanna tell you about the reading and writing. Yeah. And then we're gonna ask you to tell us how all of this is, has made you an advocate, which I think we're already well, hearing understanding well the thing is that i realized that um i was blessed to be here and when i saw so many people who couldn't speak you know i felt like um it was my responsibility i did you know why was i here you know why was why did was i allowed to get my speech back you can't go through something like that and lose so much and not feel compelled to give something back because you, you, you could have, it could have gone the wrong way, you know? So that's kind of what made me do it because I, um, I needed for people to know, I didn't want anyone to go through this again, ever. Cause Absolutely. it's horrible. Yeah. In our chat, we've asked women, uh, what will you take away from today's call? And if you haven't put a message in the chat, we want you to put that message in the chat to tell us what will you take away from this very rich conversation today with so many stories and so many things to think about um, as we prepare to end this call. We wanna hear from you, Aaliyah. Are we hearing any messages from what folks are taking away from this call today? 
Yeah, we're hearing messages about uh, folks up in their exercise. We're seeing messages about uh, ensuring that we keep educating everyone. So we don't keep the knowledge with ourselves, right? We share it with others on the importance of health and wellness um, and of these signs that we're learning. I already text my whole family group here internally and said, I won't be digging your grave. So if you want some junk, you're gonna have to buy it yourself. Um, because sometimes we change our own diets and habits, but we're like, oh, they're, they're young. Uh, but really that, that lifestyle starts young. Um, we're hearing the importance of listening to your body, pay attention to the signs, um, you know, love yourself and your family enough to eat right, eat healthy, just appreciation for kindred souls and just uh, excited for us to be in community and come back together again. This has been one of the most beautiful calls we've had yet this year. Uh, Joyce, I want you to know how blessed I am that you're here, how blessed we all are. Listening to you is actually a treat. I don't know if you if you fully understand how soothing um, and how beautiful your way of relaying information is. And that is why with that restoration of your speech and your ability to read and function when you said you felt you had to you had to help others. Uh, it was meant to be because I can feel myself just imbued with so many beautiful things from the story that you told us in this short time today. Um, and I'm so grateful for you. We will have you back. Um, I don't know by show of hands, who wants these women to come back for a part two conversation? Oh, uh, well, that does it. That seals the deal. Um, just to say, um, for what Aaliyah just said about texting her whole family and thinking about our own behaviors, uh, our team at the foundation really also values wellness and we try to live it and to support it and to promote it and what we do. Uh, back in October, I signed up for a gym membership, you know, and have been exercising regularly four to five times a week and it has been just transformational for my life, my energy, my overall health. Uh, movement is so important. What we eat is so important. Managing our stress is so important. Eliminating things from our lives that cause us stress um, and really being conscientious on a daily basis of the action steps we are taking tangibly in our life to consciously improve our health. Uh, as we name this call today, Black Women Beating heart disease, a call to action. We're asking you to take action after this call on everything you've heard and learned today and to decide for yourself what that first step for you will be to increase and expand uh, your heart health and your overall health as black women, as women, as people. Um, and with that, we want to thank you, Joyce. Uh, we thank, thank our you guests welcome. earlier. want to thank everyone who stuck with us. We want to thank you, Belly. Um, who's given us so many comments. We want to, to honor you, Belly, also for your recovery from health challenges that I saw and was following on Facebook. And we are graced to see you here today. And we send everyone blessings for optimal, blessed health. That is our birthright. We're claiming it. And let 2021 be the year that your health becomes your top priority. Uh, remember to mask up. Madison and Dane County and wherever you're checking in, we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. Please join us this Saturday for Wear Red Day. There is still time to register and the link is in the chat. Please support Pink Lily, our fundraiser. Most of all, know thyself, love thyself, heal thyself. Our wellness starts with us and we have all the power. With that, we love you and we will see you on Saturday. Take care. We love Thank you. you.